we'll get started with prayer. Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for this day and for this ability to be together to study and to show ourselves approved, but also, Father, that we would be equipped, that we would know what it is that you would have us to do with this information, because you don't just give it to us for our intellectual knowledge, but for us to be changed and also to impart that to others as well. So we ask that you will make us aware when those opportunities come and what you would have us to do in our lives to change and what you would have us to do with the information as well. Guide our discussion today because it's um, an amazing one um, and it's a great way to get off to a good start. But we want to stay on task and we want to make sure that we cover the things that would be helpful to us to understand this chapter of this amazing book that much better. We thank you for preserving it for us, for providing it for us through Paul um, and in a, sometimes a bad situation, Paul would write, but um, you had an ultimate good in it and that we have this preserved all these years. We thank you for that and ask for everything, ask for your wisdom and guidance and direction in Jesus' name and for his sake as well. Amen. Amen. All right, so this week we are um, in the Precept Bible Study Method. Last week we looked at the overview of the entire book so that we were familiar with and to be honest, most studies out there in uh, my past, maybe it's true of you as well, that would be about all, the, that would be the level of all we'd ever get. It's, it would be kind of surface level. You might get a nugget here and there, and you might you know, feel pretty good about understanding the book as a whole, um, but that is just the beginning point. That is the flying really high and getting the lay of the land. Um, starting with, as I said last week, that one, and also starting with the puzzle where we're just getting the edges. That is certainly not a completed puzzle. So now with these chapter studies, we're gonna go um, either week by week in one chapter, or sometimes there might be more than one chapter, and we're gonna be looking at um, much more detail. Hopefully you were able to follow the lesson and that you were able to do your work and that you were able to dig deep for yourselves and hopefully some of that will come out today. Um, we want to remember though this is the book of First Corinthians and if and we know it is an epistle, meaning it's a letter. The basic idea of knowing that it's a letter means two things, that we know it's, y'all help me out here, we know it's, what do we know about a letter? Participation. <laughs> that it's, it's addressed to someone. Yes, and okay. it's, from someone. Okay, so there's there's a, a sender and there's a receiver. And that's true back then and that's true today. In our time, if it were an email or snail mail, we would open it up and we would look at the bottom and we would see who it's from. With email, a lot of times we know whoever it's from, just from the address. Um, but if you got an envelope in a letter, snail mail, and it didn't have a return address, you would have to open it up to see who it's from. But in the days of Paul's writing, in this case, he identifies himself at the very beginning, and then he also identifies who he's writing to. And in this case, he's writing to a group in a place called Corinth, and therefore they're called Corinthians. Uh, Paul did not address this as a book. He did not address it. He did not put the title at the top. First Corinthians. <laughs> that is a, a man-made thing. Um, but this was inspired by God and it has been preserved by God. We know throughout our study of First Corinthians already, and, and certainly if uh, Kay mentioned it last week, and if you um, did any commentary work, they would have told you this is not, there. we have two letters preserved, but we know of at least, I believe, four. So for whatever reason, God preserved these two and he didn't preserve the others. We don't know why. Um, and therefore, we don't need to know why. But they're referenced or mentioned. And so as Paul is writing, um, we're going to look at this chapter as a whole, but we're going to look at it par paragraph by paragraph. We want to look, we want to remind ourselves of what all of Corinthians is about. Um, it is dealing with 
um, a relationship that Paul has with the Corinthians, and he's addressing problems that they have that were told to him, and he's addressing questions that they have or issues that they had that they wrote to him about. So the, the main segment division is between chapters one and six is about the problems that Paul is addressing. And then in chapter seven through, is it 16? Um, he is addressing, he's responding to whatever they have sent by way of questions. Um, I went back and looked in Acts and when Paul first went to Corinth, um, I believe he stayed something like 18 months. So if you think in your life, in our lives, if we, because I've moved around, I've lived places as little as that, you know, a few months, um, but I have usually lived places like three years. And in an 18 month period of time, let's say when we moved to Illinois and we were going to this really strong teaching church, in 18 months of time, I learned a lot. And I changed a lot in my understanding of God's word. So Paul going to Corinth and staying for a year and a half would have been very impactful. It would not have been, I mean, but as we know, when we look through the book, he still called them babes in Christ or infants because they hadn't grown beyond. They had not moved on to the meat of God's word. But so that's a big issue in the book of Corinthians. So in this particular book, this particular chapter, sorry, of the book, um, he is dealing with, we our, our title that we came up with last week had to do with the divisions, the problem was the divisions, and that they are to boast in God's wisdom and not in man's. So that's what we're looking at as a whole. If we were right about that, then what we're going to see today as we study this and look at this together in our paragraphs and in our division of the book or that was given to us, we're going to see that it supports that, that theme, if our theme is right. So when we first start in this but in this chapter, we're going to look first at the first paragraph is, is verses one to three. Um, but we really want to look at one to nine as well, because that is a very significant part. But in one to three, what overall did you learn in those three verses? How would you title that paragraph? The Calling. God's, okay. calling. God's calling. All right. Because he talks about it in reference to Paul. And he also talks about it in reference to the Corinthians as well. Okay. Thanks. The saints. Right. Um, and they are called saints. Right. So he's talking about the people that are receiving this letter. Okay. Um, it's it. It also is just in general. It's just a greeting. I mean, it is the beginning. It's the opening of the letter. Um, and then when you look at verses four to nine, how would you summarize those, not, those verses? We're gonna go into a little more detail, but I just wanna kind of get us started with that, that paragraph. How did you title that paragraph? Affirming, of, affirming the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay. They were, um, they were confirmed in the, or they confirmed the, in, um, concerning the testimony of Christ, exactly. Um, anything else? Anybody have anything else? I mean, I just, I put they're enriched, confirmed, blameless, and called into fellowship. Um, but there's a lot in these verses. Now let's look at, let's look at these first nine verses because it's here that we learn the most about the Corinthians, the most detail about the Corinthians. There's other places in this chapter, but there's other places in the book as well. But here we have the most. Um, so as we look through, and you can get your chart that you had at the end of the lesson out if you want, that talks about the Corinthian church, because on it, you may have, um, listed out, she told you to potentially list out, okay, let me get to it, um, things that you might have gotten some um, definitions of if you were questioning any of those things. Okay, there it is, sorry, I was looking through mine. Um, so in these first few verses, verses one to nine, we're gonna learn about the Corinthians. What do you, what do you know? Give me your list, starting out with first, he calls them a church, right? 
calls them the church of God at Corinth. And if you look that up, that word church is that ecclesia, the, the called out ones. The, it, it is a, it could be used in the Greek, you know, beyond the Bible, it could just be reused as an assembly. You know, anything, anytime a, a body of people got together, a group got together, um, but in this case, and it became used by Christians and throughout their writings to very be very specific. It's not just a group of people meeting. This was a select group of people. It also says that they're the church of God. Um, why would that have been important for Paul to establish that? Was it because he wanted them to know it wasn't his church, it was God's church? That's a good one. Yeah. It's not Paul's church, which, you know, we know later there's divisions and that there are people um, identifying with individuals. So that, yeah, that's very significant that this is God's church, not Paul's group of people, not Paul's buddies or whatever. I think that's very significant. Um, it's when they came in out of a culture of what in Corinth prior to Paul going there, did they, there was there a group of Christians? No, there would have been Jews and Gentiles there because we also see, um, again, if you go to the account in Acts, you see that one of the Jewish synagogue leaders is a converted follower by Paul because Paul came. And we know Paul's pattern. Whenever Paul went anywhere, who did he seek out first? The Jews. Exactly. He, I can see her lips. <laughs> um, sought out the Jews. He either went to the synagogue if there was one, or he went to where they had a place of prayer. We know the account of Lydia by the, the, the riverside um, where they would gather on the Sabbath, which would be Saturday, and had a time of prayer. So he would go seek out the Jews first. And then from them, there would be some that would believe. And then overall, there'd be a point where he basically dusted his feet off and he moved on to the Gentiles. And he would say that almost every time, you know, I'm done with you, I'm moving on. Now, obviously he wasn't done with the Jews, but if there were unbelievers and they wouldn't, they didn't believe, he moved on. But he started with the Jews and that was something Jesus did. So it makes sense. But we also have to realize that Paul was called um, as an apostle, as it says in verse one here, but his calling was to go mainly where Gentiles were. So Corinth is definitely that. It's a cosmopolitan city in a central area with lots of traffic going back trade and commerce and ships and everything else going back and forth. So it was a, a Mecca area. I mean, it was a, I shouldn't say Mecca because that's a completely different thing, but it was an area of, of lots of people coming back and forth. Um, when there were converts in Corinth, it was a large group, by the way. The Corinth church was a large group of, of conversions, which is incredible. But they're coming out of either Judaism or they're coming out of idolatry and heathenism. Um, there's not a hint of Christianity there. And so as Christians, or as Americans, I should say, whether or not, you know, whatever your salvation story is, whether or not you were taken to church or not taken to church and you got saved at whatever point in your life, for me, it was, I was 29 and I grew up in the church and I basically never stopped going to church even before I was saved or after I got saved. There was a period of time I wasn't a great attender, but I didn't get saved till I was 29, but I was exposed to Christianity my entire life. It's really difficult for me to believe there's anyone in America that's never heard about God. Now, do they know him? No. Do they really understand the gospel? Maybe not, but there's churches everywhere. And there are people in the world and there's people in America that believe if you're born American, you're born a what? Christian, right. Um, just like we think of people in Mid Middle Eastern countries, if they're born there, then they are Muslim, you know, or if they're in Israel, they're all Jews. There can be a genetic aspect to it, but certainly the, the 
belief aspect or the religious aspect is something entirely different. But even in, in Muslim countries, on their birth certificate, it lists them as Muslim if they're born there. Um, but there are many that believe if you're, if you're an American, you're a Christian. And unfortunately, there's some Americans that believe that. And I've, I've talked to them where they'll say, I've always been a Christian. And as I put it, being carried in the building nine months before you're born doesn't make you any more than me standing in my garage makes me a car. Um, that's an old saying that is easy to illustrate. So with this group of people, I think it's very important that he's talking about Elohim or he's talking about God. He's not talking about a God, little g. He's not talking about the whatevers, the pluralism of the idolatry that they have. This is a church that's, that's of God, from God, God created it. And I do believe it's very important that it's not Paul's church. You know, that is another thing that I think is important about it. So, but they are a church and they're the church of God. It happens to be a Corinth, if you want to put that there, but this, that is the name of the book. What else do we know about this group? Just go through the verses and tell me what it says about them. Saints by calling. Saints by calling. Okay, let's just get our list up here and then we can talk about them. What else? Right before saints, it says another word that's similar. Sanctified. 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 Okay, what else? Given the grace of God in Christ. They're blameless. Blameless, okay. What else? <clears throat> Not lacking in any gift. Okay. What else? I'm looking at my list, by the way, if you're wondering. We said it before, Sandy said it before, confirmed by the testimony. What's the testimony? Jesus Christ. Anybody got any more? Awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord. Okay. <clears throat> I didn't put all those words, but I put it up there. Um, what about uh, what about uh, called into fellowship? Okay. And who are they called into fellowship with? Jesus. Yeah. We're the son. Jesus. We know that's Jesus. Okay. Um, Quarrels among them. Okay. We're not there yet, but yeah, that would, that comes later. We're, we're just going to verse nine at this point. Um, okay. Is that, that's not in that part no. yet. No. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, we'll get to that in a minute, hopefully. <laughs> um, Lord willing. Just wanted to get most of this up here. I'm going to say also, Jesus is their Lord. And God is their Father. Sometimes it doesn't say it as directly, but, you know, it does say it. Um, we've already said they're not lacking any gift but it also says they're enriched in everything. Okay. 
specifically mentions what two categories? Speech and knowledge. And we did say conf confirmed and blameless, but it's saying they shall be confirmed to the end and blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I think it's valid for sure to put them up there. Um, they're also called in verse 10. We're going to look at, at three more verses that go beyond these three because we're going to put our list up here. In verse 10, they're called brethren. In verse 14, they've been baptized. And in verse 30, it says they're in Christ Jesus. Okay, that's, that's a good enough list for now because we really want to be able to talk about some of these things. But just for a second, I want you to think about this entire book, this chapter in particular, but this entire book. If we didn't have those first nine verses, and other than these last three things I put up on the board, the brethren baptized and in Christ, everything else that we put up here, saints, sanctified, going to be confirmed and confirmed blameless. They have the testimony of Christ. They are not lacking in any gift. They're enriched in everything. They're awaiting the revelation, eagerly, the revelation of our Lord. Jesus is their Lord. God is their father. They're the church. They're called into fellowship. Okay. All of those things. That's a wonderful thing to be said, have all that said about, right? Um, I'm, I'm listening to this man do some business training. And one of the things he does is his own discipline, which I think is bizarre. I may have told y'all this already because I think it's so bizarre. It was bizarre, but really, really cool is he has written his own obituary. And every morning as he starts his day and his work day and he works from home is he starts it by reading his obituary. And the idea is backwards from that, basically he's written what he wants to have said about him. He wants it to be true. And he wants that said about him at his death, which he projects to be decades down the road because he's relatively young. And then he backs it up and says, okay, if, if I'm going to be that, what do I need to be in five years? What do I need to be in 10 years? What do I need to be in 20 years? Whatever points between he puts, he starts setting goals and setting up patterns and, and practicing those things to get to that obituary that he has written for himself. Now, it's kind of a bizarre practice, but you understand when you understand why he's doing it, you understand what he's doing. He's not writing some fiction that he wants to have read someday. He's writing the goals that he has for himself and how he would get there. So if you were, ha if you were to have this read about you at your obituary, as your obituary, at your funeral, would you be glad to have these things said about you? I think I, I would say yes. <laughs> this could be my obituary. I mean, I could write this and say, this is what I want said about me. And so it's definitely, good. these are definitely good things. Are these things true? Not just about me. I'm saying, are these things true about the Corinthians? Is Paul writing truth? Or is he just puffing them up? He knows them. He's their spiritual father. He gave birth to them, in essence. God did, but he was part of the process. This is a pattern that Paul uses where he tells truth about them by way of reminder for both of them <laughs> as he goes forward. Because we know starting in verse 11, this doesn't sound the same. But everything we read after verse 9 in this book, these first verses are true. Don't forget that. As you go through the study of Corinthians, you might need to keep this list handy. 
because if these nine verses were taken out, the rest of the book would basically cause us to question and maybe seriously doubt whether or not who Paul is writing to are Christians. Can I get an amen? And verses 10 and on could be written about most churches in America. Could the first nine verses be written about those same churches? So as we ever study for ourselves personally, application is hugely important. Remember that it's never just about putting information down, reading it, doing our lesson and doing our work gaining the knowledge. It's about making that knowledge sink in and convict and change and transform us more and more into the image of Christ. So as we do that, as we look at these, we want to see ourselves in this. And if not, we want to see ourselves in this. If this isn't true of us, then we need to do what it needs to do to make this true of us. Maybe that's why someone is here for such a time as this, is to understand that they're not on this board right now. And if you're not, we'll talk and, and we'll make that, we'll make a change. But otherwise, then we're on this board and this is true. Hopefully the rest of this book isn't as true, but maybe we'll find ourselves in that as well. But it just keep in mind, if these first nine verses were not in this book, we would struggle with the rest of the book, believing these people are saved. So we have to keep coming back to this. And these things are true of them. They are true of them. Paul wrote them. He's not lying. And God preserved it. He knows them. But there's a huge now, if you noticed last week when we were going through, every time... Um, Every time you see throughout this book, a now, it's, it's Paul introducing a new subject. So here he starts with now. I exhort you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all agree. Okay, sorry. Let's back up a little bit and let's look at some of these things. Church of God, we've already talked about. Saints by calling. If you looked that word up, did anybody look up the word saint? It's the word hagios, and if you look at the word sanctified, it's the word hagiazo, hagiazo, sorry. So they're from essentially the same root. Um, they have to do with, the saints are, in this case, it says saints by calling, um, and they are holy or set apart. That's what the word saint means. Sanctified means hallowed or sanctified, standing in contrast to koinos, which means common. Okay, so sanctified is the idea that something that had a common usage, like my mug here that I've got hot tea in, there's a common use for this. But if for whatever reason, this became a sanctified mug that was put into service, it was never to come back to common use. And some of you know, I've told this story before, and I was thinking about it again this morning. I have two large dogs. I had, used to have three large dogs. They drink a lot of water and I was struggling because I had a small water bowl for the dogs and I was constantly having to fill it. And I got this brilliant idea that I had an old crock from an old crock pot that had broken, but I had, I mean, the metal part, it stopped working. So I had kept the insert, you know, the part that you remove and, and has the stuff and I wash it. So it's like this big, it's huge. It's a whatever, probably 10, 12 quarts. Um, and that's what I use as my dog water bowl. And it, it works really well because I don't have to fill it up very much. My dogs can reach it. My cats can drink out of it too. But I don't put that back into common use. <laughs> that has been set apart as my dog drinking bowl and I don't bring it back in the kitchen and fill it up and use it as a crock anymore. Just saying. So it's that idea is that when something has been set apart for a, a specific purpose, it doesn't go back to common use. And when you think of yourself that way, you know, we all walked around in our commonness 
defiled and commonness of life prior to salvation. But once we got saved, we're not to go back to that old life and those old ways. We're not to let our bodies be used in a common way or our minds or our spirits to be used in a common way anymore. We're set apart. Um, we still walk in this world. We'll still live in this world. And we still do live in these bodies that we struggle with. But we're now different. And we need to keep, keep thinking of ourselves that way. The idea of sanctified is that, that God has taken us and caused us to be sanctified or set apart. But then there's a process in ourselves where we walk in that and we see ourselves that way. So that's the responsibility of man and the, and the um, sovereignty of God. Okay, uh, Jesus is Lord is another one. If you looked up the word Lord, that means master or owner. Um, it, it's the basic Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Jehovah, which was the most um, important name of God in the Old Testament. Um, and we know the Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew. And we know the New Testament was written primarily in Koine Greek. So we have to find those uh, crossovers. So this isn't just um, boss that we can say no to. This isn't just husband that we're supposed to be um, under the authority of um, and we sometimes buck that. This isn't a teenager with a parent. This is, we can't say no. We effectively can't say no, we shouldn't say no. This is the sovereign ruler of the universe. So when we call Jesus Lord, when they are, when Jesus is their Lord, this is not just somebody that we might listen to. This is somebody we have to listen to. Um, and even in the greeting, I, I loved it in verse three, the grace and peace. Grace is a common Christian greeting because it's the charis or the charis. That's the name of my dog, charis, um, meaning the gift of God. It's the salvation gift. It's the gift in our life from that point forward. But peace is the idea of shalom. It's more of the Jewish greeting. And it, it's not just peace as in lack of conflict. It's also an overall well-being um, and the, the, the totality of your peace, your mental, your physical, and your spiritual peace as well. So it's kind of cool that that's in there. Um, so in when it's talking about they have the grace of God, wherever we put that, somewhere, we put it up there somewhere, they have given the grace of God in Christ. Um, it's almost like the word given is, is redundant because grace is a gift. So it is given. But who's it given by? God. Right. So even though Paul uses the word in his greeting to them, it's still from God that that grace is given. They have it. And, and here's something that we always need, always need to remember. Whatever we've been given because of our salvation is something that we have access to for the rest of our lives. And to give an example of that, um, reconciliation. You know, reconciliation is the idea of two far apart things or people being brought close, enemies being made non-enemies. And that's what happened for us. But also we were given the gift of reconciliation and therefore we have the ministry of reconciliation. First ministry of reconciliation is reconciling people to God. And the second ministry of rec reconciliation is that we have the role of reconciling people to people reconciling ourselves to someone if needed, but also helping to reconcile people to people. So we have those gifts, they're given to us. We're given the gift of forgiveness. Therefore, we can now forgive. Everything that's being put in us, we can now let go out of us. Um, the testimony of Christ was confirmed in them. What, what's the significance of that? Remember, thinking in terms of a brand new thing coming to an area that had never seen this before. 
They were Jews and they were Greeks or Gentiles. No Christianity there before. So what is the significance of the testimony of Christ? Or the, is, what does it say? The testimony of our Lord? Testimony of Christ was confirmed in them. That also. What's the significance of that? It was a real change. Okay. Seen, made evident. Right. That's good. Okay. Christ being central to this, right? He makes the difference. You've got Jews, right? Jews believe in God. The Gentiles believe in a whole lot of gods. But Jesus is what sets us apart. Y'all remember the Columbine situation where the girl had the gun in her face and the guy said do you believe in God her response was I believe in Jesus now I'm making an emphasis of that I don't know how she said it but that sets us apart because there's a whole lot of people out there and a lot of spirituality claiming a lot of things including belief in God and God is just I mean God is not casual <laughs> don't get me wrong but people throw that out there and again born in america believe in god but they're not walking it they're not following it and as it's not seen like sandy was saying it's not confirmed in them if it's not even seen it's not a testimony is a eyewitness of account right if you went to testify in court you would be given your eyewitness account your eyewitness testimony. So again, it, it, there's an old word picture of if you were in a courtroom today and it was illegal to be a Christian and you were on the stand and the prosecutor stands up and starts questioning you, would there be enough evidence against you to convict you as a Christian? Is there enough that's seen in your life? Would there be enough witnesses that could be brought in that would say yes and here's why? Kind of kind of makes you think, right? Makes me think. Hope it does you. They're not lacking in any gift. Now this word gift, we go back to grace, is charis. It's the idea of that the salvation is the gift of God. So they're not lacking in that. But they're also not lacking, as we're going to look at in the chapters 12 through 14, spiritual gifts, the, the charisma, charismata, to um, have those in them. We're also going to see that this is not saying the individual Corinthian Christian has every spiritual gift, because that's not true of anyone, but as a community, as a whole. They don't lack any spiritual gift. And think about this. That should be true, even if it's a small group meeting in a, a church, in a home, or if it's your local body church, you know, a group of hopefully believers, or at least some are believers. And then the church universal, the true church of God is not lacking in any gifts, but your local fellowship should also have all the spiritual gifts. Are, they op are you as a whole operating in all the spiritual gifts? We'll get to that in another lesson, but just to be thinking about it. Awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For those of you who study revelation with me or you know the, what the word revelation means, what does that word mean? Remember, it's the unveiling. Final outcome something like that well revelation is the unveiling that the word actually means the unveiling it is translated the apocalypsis we've heard of apocalypse um, but that's just from this word um usually when we use the word apocalypse we're thinking you know doom and gloom and end of the world destruction which obviously if you read the book of revelation you see that as well but the word just means an uncovering or an unveiling <clears throat> and here's the thing <clears throat> God has to unveil our eyes or unveil our hearts in order for us to receive salvation to start with. So we start 
with an unveiling. But there's also a, a revelation or an unveiling and uncovering that we're waiting for eagerly. And that usually is a synonymous term with the return of Christ for his bride. And remember, the bride wears a veil. <laughs> there's a reason for that. <laughs> if, if they kind of gotten away from it, but there's a reason for that because Christ is returning for his bride. Um, and then in verse eight, it says, who Christ shall re, shall also confirm you to the end blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's already talked about the uh, revelation of our Lord. And then now he's talking about the day of Christ um, or the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at that point, you're going to be confirmed and you're going to be um, blameless in the end. <clears throat> Hallelujah. But he's also saying this in a way of reminder. There's a process. There are, are you want to be blameless. Paul says in other letters, I want to present you as this blameless bride before Christ. You don't need so that you don't need to be ashamed. And we need to keep that in mind. Called into fellowship with his son. That fellowship is the koinonia, the, um, the relationship with Jesus. And again, called. All the time we're hearing this word called. You looked up the word called this week. What did you learn about it? Do you remember? Summoned. Summoned okay. <clears throat> Invited, summoned. Those are words, right? Um, by who? By whom? Uh, by God. By God, exactly. In this case, it's the divine call. You've received the divine call. <clears throat> when I looked it up throughout, um, I found it in verse, a form of call, calling or called. I found it in verse one, verse two, verse nine, verse 24 and verse 26. And I found four different words um, for the, but there's, but two of them are very similar. Um, the first one, the called or the invitation, the, uh, the divine call is kletos, um, but there's also klesis, which is the verb of that. One is the noun and one is the verb. Um, in the case of verse one, Paul is called as an apostle. That's more the idea of not just called by God in his salvation, but appointed as an apostle in his calling. Now that didn't happen later. Whatever you're called, the gifting that you're given, your spiritual gift, is given at salvation. And I know that because every Christian has a spiritual gift. Therefore, it has to be given at salvation. But that doesn't mean you know what it is yet. That might come over time. You might become more aware. Number one, I was a Christian, didn't even know there was such a thing as spiritual gifts. So it took a while to learn that. And then it took a while to be able to discern with God's help what mine are. And what do you think my primary spiritual gift is? There you go. <laughs> Teaching. Teach. Teach. It doesn't have to be to be a leader of a Bible study, but it does help <laughs> um, that that is my primary spiritual gift. Another uh, version was in verse nine, which is call, and it means to, again, invite a divine invitation, but it also can be blessings of redemption, and it implies a vocation. So sometimes we use that as like a, a pastor, for instance, may say he has a call on his life, and they're really more talking about as their, not just their spiritual calling, their salvation call, maybe not even their spiritual gifts necessarily, but they're as a vocation, they're going to dedicate their lives to that particular job, a vocation. Um, so that's another. Um, in verse two, um, where it says called, Saints by calling, maybe. Yeah, saints by calling or call upon the name. Call upon the name. This is um, being declared or dedicated to a person, like to the Lord, um, and to call upon and invoke that name. So this is a little different. The other was, uh, I mean, it still is similar because 
we would not invoke the name of the Lord or invoke the name of God without being his, without having been called. So this is more of the outcome of our call is that we in turn call upon him. So this is more from, from us. So um, I love word studies. So I always like to stop and look at what those have to do. Um, in verse 10, we went to brethren and that is easy. That one's the word brother. Um, in, in, in the Hebrew, a comparison would be a distant relative, but in the use in the Christian circles, it was that they had something in common and that commonality was their faith, was their Christianity. So we would call each other sisters. We could call each other brothers if we wanted to, but, you know, in the sense of brethren, but we're sisters in Christ. Um, and it's more of a, um, we're in, in this, this, this community, this fellowship, and that fellowship is a relationship based and we, we hold things in common, but it supersedes and is in a sense more important than our genetic relationships, because we know sometimes in our genetics and our, in our families, we don't always have believers in our families that we can call, you know, a brother and sister in Christ. And baptize is, has like kind of two meanings. One is it is the um, act of obedience on the part of a Christian to be immersed in water and be baptized. I mean, that's the, okay, let, let me give you a little history. When the King James Version was translated by the translators and commissioned by the horrible King James, um, they did not, this was a controversial subject, whether you immersed or whether you poured or whether you sprinkled or whether you laid a hand on whatever the practice was in the various religious groups, they didn't want to mess with that. So they just took the Greek word, which is B-A-P-T-I-Z-O, when you spell it out in um, the non-Greek letters, the, the English letters, um, and they just, what they called transliterated it. They didn't translate it into the word that it meant. They are the, the words that would give it a meaning or a definition. They just said, okay, we're just gonna take these words and we're gonna English as them. And they use the word baptize. So it was to, to keep from being controversial. <laughs> interesting and then we've just continued that throughout time and we have an idea of what this means um, but it also means identity so if you're baptized into christ you're identified with him you are paul says in another epistle that we are baptized into his death his burial and his resurrection and that's the picture of coming out you know coming up out of the water is we die and then we come to newness of life but really the more important thing is that if thief didn't come down on the cross and get wet he still went with Jesus just just saying but if we have the ability to in an act of obedience be baptized we should whereas the more important thing is that identity with Christ Okay, and then um, in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Those are the things that we can know about this group that are very important. Now, as we move on to verses 10 through 17, we see the problem as it is addressed. And Sandy mentioned it earlier. They're the, the quarrels. What is, what is the reason for their quarrels? What had they begun doing? Saying they belong to one person or another. Okay, very good. It was also called divisions. You know, the, the quarrels came from the divisions. And those divisions were, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. Um, this is pretty easy on the surface to even begin to understand, but if you did any commentary work, they went a little, uh, the words I read even went a little bit deeper about what each one of these may have aligned to. But the main things that we need to know here is this word divisions is the word um, that we get our word schism from. 
it's S C H I schismo or something uh, when when you spell it out in the Greek. But it's not the idea of the. It, it's more of the idea. A better translation would be click. And we all have experienced clicks at some point in our lives, like at school or in a club that we're belong to or whatever. But we can also see them in churches. And the reason for their clicks or the titles of their clicks are Paul's guys, Paulus's guys, you know, whatever. Now, here's the thing. Did Apollos go and say, hey, you guys come with me? No. Did Paul say that? You know, hey, I'm the best one. You need to be my people. No, we've already said this is not Paul's church. He did not, he did not do things that way. Peter, we don't even know about Peter going to Corinth, but apparently he did, because you've got, or people just say, hey, we've heard from Peter, or we know who Peter is, or, you know, whatever. Somehow, they've attached themselves to Peter, Cephas, and then you've got those, that group that says, I'm of Christ, and you're going, okay, that's the good group, not necessarily, <laughs> not necessarily, because they're looking at all these other groups and saying, I don't really care about any of them. I have Christ. I don't need anybody else. And to a certain extent, that's true. We have the Holy Spirit. We have Christ. We don't need, but God still gives us these people, these spiritual gifts that we should be following and listening and under. Um, so there's, there's reason for that. But the people that were, I am of Christ may have been the people that were special information, I've got a direct line to God that you don't have, spiritual superiority. There could be all kinds of things that were behind the I'm of Christ group. So um, first I looked at it and went, well, that's the good group. <laughs> Not necessarily. The point Paul wants us to know, one of the things is not one of these men does Paul tear down. They, did, they were not the problem. Their message was not the problem. Their ministry and practices were not the problem. It's the people that attach themselves to them. And we've got to be careful of this. How does this look in our lives? I mean, just give me some examples of, of things that you thought of this week that could be an example of this so that we're not just passing by and going, hey, I, I'm not aligning myself with this. The different types of churches. That, that yeah, it's, it's not always, but that can be an example of it. Um, I had one pastor once say that every denomination has its piece of the pie. You know, like they stood on a particular doctrine or set of doctrines that set them apart from another group or they disagreed with another group on. And man, they, they hunker down on that set, you know, and say, you know, we're better than all the, it, whether they really say it or not, at some level you think, ours is better because we have this structure. We, we focused on how a church should be set up and administered. They don't do that. This other group says, but we dunk and you sprinkle. And then we've got another group <laughs> that says, you know, whatever. So yeah, denominations can be that, but they, they're not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes denominations just came up regionally. You know, a group of people lived in an area and they just came called something, you know, or they called themselves something. Um, but it can be that, yes. Anything else? I thought of communion. There's, you know, some that, on, on how we do communion, whether we do it, how often we do it, um, what it represents. That's again, that piece of the pie, right? Right. Where, right. There's um, a difference though in, in how they view, how we view it. Right. And even to the extent that if I walked in and sat down and I wasn't a member of your congregation or denomination, I can't participate. Right. That can happen. Um, 
I mean, the only thing in my opinion that should prevent, well, there's a couple of things, but one, I don't, I would not ever go snatch it out of anybody's hands, <laughs> but I wouldn't, when my children were not saved, I didn't have them participate in communion, partly as a testimony to them, you know, like giving them the opportunity to say, why, why does everybody get this and we don't, you know, and, and so that it gave us an opportunity to have a conversation. Um, but if, if you had your children take communion, I'm, I'm not kicking you out. <laughs> you know, I'm not, this is not a hill we need to die on. And that's really what this is about is what are the important things that we cannot compromise on that are, that are basic doctrine that we are going to need to all agree on. And then what are the extras? Red carpet, blue carpet, you know, stained glass windows, not stained glass windows, choir or praise band. Those are not stepping away from faith issues. Those are not disfellowshipping issues. And that's what we need to discern and, and not catch ourselves in whether it's denomination, certain practices or people. And usually these are man-centered. That's what Paul's talking about here. You know, this person teaches this and I'm only going to listen to him. As soon as you start doing that, and okay, if you go to a church and you have one pastor and you listen to him every week, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that because you're also coming and doing Bible study, for instance. I'm just talking about if you align yourself with one person and only ever listen to that person, chances are you're going to walk away in, in some sort of clique or division or doctrinal difference. There's a, a difference in at times in our lives personally, or a time in a church even, where there is a focus on a particular thing. Like I had a pastor that taught on reconciliation for an entire year. He didn't neglect everything else in the process, but he didn't necessarily focus on some of these other things in the process. That's called being selective for a time. There's a difference. But if he had fo focused on reconciliation and call it the reconciliation church, and that's all he ever talked about for the rest of time and did neglect truth and even got to the point where he denied parts of truth, that's when you end up with a problem. And that, that's, the, that's one of the differences. So when Paul goes on and he has a solution to this, part of his solution is these questions. Was Christ divided? You know, did, did Christ give Paul part of it and Cephas part of it and Apollos part of it and kept some for himself? No. Did the truth get divided? No. Paul even goes into, I'm glad I didn't baptize. He said any and then many, and, you know, he, he baptized a few. Apparently, Paul's way was to give others the baptism, you know, thing, part. And it's really good in this case because they would definitely probably have allied themselves or aligned themselves. And maybe that's where some of this came from. Maybe when Apollos came, he baptized some people. Maybe when Peter came, he baptized some people. I don't know. Obviously, Christ didn't. But, you know, Jesus didn't baptize when he was in his earthly ministry. He gave that to others. But it also showed up as a problem with John, not John being the problem, but that people then said, I'm of John's baptism. I'm not of Jesus's baptism. Even happened then. So these are things that, you know, Paul's asking these questions. You know, where did this come from? Is there a basis for this? And the answer is no. We're not to be following men, people we're to be following Christ. He's the one and only. And, and all of this comes from him. Um, and then he goes into the next section, starting in verse 18 to 25. And he's contrasting two things over and over again. What is the contrast? Wisdom and foolishness. Oh. That's, that's a big big contrast wisdom versus foolishness he also uses it in another contrast what is weakness. weakness weakness strength weakness. 
versus weakness. Okay, now throughout this, um, there's, there's more than one contrast in these contrasts, okay? So first he's talking about the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. And then he's also talking about the foolishness of the world versus the foolishness of God. He's talking about strength as the world sees it versus weakness as the world sees it. And he's said that talking about true strength and weakness as, as God sees it. So there's a, there's a real contrast here between the world and God, I guess is one of the way to put it, or worldly, worldliness versus godly, godliness. That's the big contrast here. And we don't have a lot of time. I really, really want us to, to get this though. You've, I, and, and this, I'm, I'm going to say it kind of from me because I don't know what your experience is, but up to now, when I would look at this most of the time, and I've heard it preached and I've, I've seen it in Sunday school lessons, I've seen it myself, I've read it and all that. I got pretty easily that the, the message of, from God looks like foolishness to the world. They don't get it right? Okay. And we're not standing here in superiority saying they're dumb <laughs> because once we were dumb, we didn't get it. Go back to what revelation means. God had to unveil it to us. God had to open our hearts to the truth. We didn't get it on our own. So that's one of the things that's coming through here. What the world sees as wise, they see the gospel as, as foolish. And, and the, the opposite is completely true. What the world sees as the foolishness of God is the true wisdom. So it's, it's completely the opposite. But there's also another thing in here, because it's talking about the wise and the foolish and the strong and the weak and it's talking about God's choice. Which one did God choose? Okay, I heard an answer, but I didn't hear what it was. From the world, from the way the world views, no, no, from God's view and really even the world's view of me, I was weak and I was foolish. And God chose me. And this is so important for us to remember. He didn't look at me and say, she's white, female, intelligent, young, capable, whatever else you want to put on there. <laughs> he didn't look at me in his foreknowledge and say, She's worth saving. Therefore, I'm going to save her. And look at all she's going to do for me. Therefore, I'm going to choose her. That's not how God's sovereignty works. The only value I have is the value he puts on me. He didn't choose me for what I would do for him. He didn't choose me because I was going to choose him. You have to finish the sentence. God chose me. Period. Not because God chose me. Period. Because if you add anything to it, then it's about my value, what I could bring to the table. And that's not what salvation is about. He didn't say, you're stupid. I'm going to choose you. <laughs> he didn't say, you're, you're, you're crippled. If you think about the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount with, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And when you break down and look at the Sermon on the Mount, the word blessed is the word closest to happy that you can find in the Bible. But it's basically the idea of you're poor in spirit. 
he chooses you and therefore you become blessed. Not you become poor in spirit and then you get blessed. You have to already be. I mean, you are poor in spirit. Now understand the word poor. Poor isn't I can't afford a cup of coffee today because I got to wait to my next paycheck. Poor is you've got no arms, no legs, no means of income. You can't move. You can't get up. You can't produce an income and nobody will give you anything. That's poor completely destitute and incapable of getting anything for yourself. That's poor in spirit. That person receives salvation. That's how we need to see ourselves. Foolish and weak. Worm dirt, as a friend of mine used to call it. That's who God saved. Because if it was based on what I could do, or what God could foresee me doing, and I might be capable of, what if something happened to stop me from being able to do that? Would I lose my salvation? Would God choose not to save me? It wasn't based on me. Think about the times in scripture where he chose Jacob over Esau when they were in the womb. Neither one had done a thing. They hadn't even shown up in this world. But God chose Jacob over Esau. This is how we need to see salvation. And that's what's so important about these verses. Is to understand from the world's perspective of things versus God's perspective of things. It's the complete opposite. I actually had one person say, whatever happens in your life, whatever thought, you know, whatever happens in your life, if you will first write down your natural reaction and then figure out 180 degrees out from that, that's more probably what God wants from you. The exact opposite of our nature. I mean, that's a rule of thumb. Obviously, it doesn't always apply. But when we see ourselves that way and we understand then we can just praise God for the choice that I didn't make, that he made and he alone made. Not because I'm worth it, but because he saw me and chose me before the foundation of the world, by the way. And that it's, it's the things the world sees as unworthy. The see things the world, so we, we're seen by the world as, as foolish and as weak. I mean, can we get an amen on that? What does the world say about Christians? That we're stupid, we're foolish, that we're weak, that, that you know, meekness is weakness. That's not true. So much so that you know, there was an old painting years ago in Rome of a man looking at uh, someone, a man named Alex Samos or something like that, um, looking at someone crucified. And it was the body of a man with a face of an ass, a donkey. And it was Alex Samos worshiping his God because that's how foolish they saw the gospel of the cross, the message of the cross, as some idiot worshiping an ass. And when we see that, then we begin to understand why the world doesn't get it. And in the case of these Corinthians, Paul came in with this message. Some received it because God unveiled it to them. It makes no sense from a human standpoint. It's another thing about salvation. It makes no sense. And to the Jews, they looked at it and said, God wouldn't have done it this way. To the Greeks, they're saying, you know, let's think about this. This is not logical. And yet some believed, which is a miracle from God, a gift of God. And that's what a lot of this part is about. Yes, the gospel looks like foolishness to the world. And the foolishness of the world is foolishness. To God, it's not wisdom. 
the wisdom of the world, what they think is wisdom is really foolishness. That part we get pretty easily. This other part we've got to be able to see. What did God choose? He chose the weak, the foolish, the, de the base, the despised. Remember what I said about sanctified? Something in common use, defiled and common, is brought into a holy use, set apart unto God. That's us. As a result, can I boast in myself? Can I boast in any of you? Can I say I'm of Sandy? Because boy, if I said that, I've got two or three of you. <laughs> Can I say I'm of Deb? Can I say I'm of Jane or Janie? Um, no, I can't say that. And you can't say you're of me or don't, please don't. Because who are we? We're just another saved thing that was taken from the base, taken from the foolish, taken from the weak. And God gave us value. Not the world and not me. Therefore, I can't boast before God in myself and I can't boast before God about anybody else. Who am I to boast in? Who only am I to boast in? I'm to boast in the Lord. And verse 31 happens to be a um, Old Testament reference to Jeremiah. So Lord there is not little O-R-D, it's capital. So this is boast in Jehovah. I love it when there's Old Testament references to the Lord. Um, so this, this is an amazing chapter to start us off, to get us off the ground here. Two big things, three big things to remember out of this is that this is the church. They are true believers filled with sinners that have been saved and still live in this body and struggle. Can raise our hand to that one. We need to look at our churches and see what role are we playing in that? What role is our church? You know, how is our church doing? Are we to say something? Are we to not say something? Are we to affect change or not? Ask yourself those questions. Do we see ourselves as somebody that God saved out of nothing? And he, and he elevated us out of the darkness into light, but that he didn't look at me and say, she's a winner. I'm going to pick her. Don't think of yourself that way. Bring yourself, like rip everything away and realize that at that point of nothingness, God chose you. It's a beautiful thing. It's an awesome thing. I mean, a lot of people get upset with me when I start on this because they're like, Make your, you're making me feel bad. Well, I hope to. Because the good news is so great when you come from that place. Anybody have anything else they wanted to add? Sermonized for a while, sorry. There was so much when I did started getting into the word studies and into the um, commentaries and stuff at the end when she gave us permission. That's the only time I do it. Um, there's really a lot to this one chapter and the rest of the book is just going to get better. So just remember, we're going to do 1 Corinthians, and then in the fall, we'll do 2 Corinthians. So we're going to be with the Corinthians for a while, and we're going to get to know them very, very well. And keep in mind, keep this list in your forefront, because it's going to be a struggle to see this church, this group of people, as saved if we didn't have this information. But we also need to see ourselves as the prior saved people that we were and they were, and, and the after saved people that don't do so well sometimes, and not to give ourselves excuses, but just to see that we can relate, and what do we need to learn from this. So I'm going to end, and then we'll come back and do the video for those who want to stay for it. I'll end in prayer. Sorry, I went a little bit long. Um, it's hard to get it all in. 
Heavenly Father, I just ask that you take these truths and you let them be real to us if they're right, that we could go back and just study this, that we would, we would anchor ourselves down with this truth of who we are in you, what you have given us, but also from what you've taken us out of and that you have set us apart. And, and again, you, you've poured your grace over us and we just absorb it. We just like soak it in, Father. And we thank you for that. Help us to, to just discern the truth through all of this and cause it to resonate in us. Sometimes, Father, these are things that are very, very different than what maybe what we learned growing up or what we've known up to a point. And you're bringing that truth to us for a reason, that changes need to be made, if, even if it's just a small step across the line, because we're close, we're, we're really there. But it causes us to see and just, just be so grateful and love this fellowship that you have given us with your son and with each other as a result. And that we would carry forth from that place in love to the rest around us. And we would bring this truth to them as well. We thank you for it and ask you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. See you hopefully next week. I'm going to stop the recording.